Yeah, good day. Well, what a day of democracy and parliamentary paradise here again, uh, getting in there, making speeches and asking the questions uh, that a lot of people want asked. And today we had uh, quite a lot to say um, about the questions around what's happening with this vaccine mandate. Uh, when does MIQ get skipped? Uh, when can people actually expect this traffic light system to happen, seeing as that's our destiny now, but it's not clear uh, what it will take to get there. Um, happy to take questions if people want to fire those through about some of those COVID-related issues. It's been a good and big, well, it's actually been a good day, but it's been a big day uh, on COVID. Um, but we're here today to talk about housing, uh, mainly because of the quite extraordinary legislation that the Labour and National Party have combined uh, to put into Parliament and aim to rush through Parliament by the 3rd of December. I'm going to try and break down uh, what this means because it hasn't had a lot of reporting considering how significant it is. And I think if people had a better understanding of it from you know, having seen it reported a bit more, I think people would probably have quite strong views uh, about this resource management enabling housing supply and other measures amendment bill. Uh, that's what it's called. Uh, and you can search it, you can find it, you can see videos of me and others uh, giving speeches about it in Parliament today. So if you go right back to the beginning, uh, we have a real problem with housing in New Zealand. And I'd sum it up this way. Uh, we're a country that is practically uninhabited and yet has somehow managed to end up uh, with a shortage of housing. So if you look around the world, there's a few places that are less inhabited than New Zealand. Uh, there's Greenland, cold, Canada, cold, Russia, cold, Australia, scorching. Uh, and then there's New Zealand, which is pretty much up there on having a low population density. Not many people, lots of space, shouldn't be too hard to build lots of homes and it'd be really easy for people to get on the ladder, um, have a place to call their own uh, and work towards doing other things that are important to them in their lives, or at least uh, that's what you might think uh, would happen. And in reality, when you look at the way that the world uh, has shaped up over the last 20 years, uh, New Zealand has become one of the most unaffordable housing markets in the world. And the question is why? Uh, so some people would say, look, it's, it's all those NIMBYs, you can't build anything, the council gets in the way, they won't let you build stuff. Um, and there, there's a grain of truth in that. But once you start to look at it more carefully and you actually talk to people who are affected um, by the business, uh, all of a sudden you find that there's actually some quite different issues uh, that are important and that are stopping people uh, get stuff built. One of them is infrastructure. And I just want to quote something uh, from the Minister of Housing. Just, just, just last December, um, Simon Court, who's one of ACT's spokespeople on environment, he asked a question to Megan Woods um, about, you know, will, will they relax zoning? Because uh, that's what this legislation does now. So go back to December. And Megan Woods said, the biggest barrier to increasing housing supply in urban growth areas now remember, this is Labour, this is the Minister of, of Housing, and beyond is the cost and provision of infrastructure. And then she helpfully gives examples, e.g. three waters, transport and community infrastructure. And that, when you talk to people, and I do talk to people who are involved in um, you know, development, uh, people who work in the council, uh, people who are planning experts, uh, people on the ground who are trying to actually get more homes built and connect all the pipes up so people have a place to live, they'll say, look, you know, yes, there's bureaucracy. Yes, there are zoning problems. Uh, yes, too many people object and it's too slow to do stuff. All, all of that is true to some extent. Um, but as the Minister of Housing said just last year, um, that's not the real issue. The real issue is the councils can't afford uh, to fund the infrastructure. And as a result, uh, they don't build a lot of houses. So the conclusion I've come to uh, looking at this issue over the last wee while um, is that actually, you know what, the, the big problem we have with housing in New Zealand um, is not actually a problem with uh, the, 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 the supply of land. Uh, it's the supply of the infrastructure that turns land into actual serviceable sections. If you can't afford the pipes, if you don't have the footpaths, if you can't have the local recreation centre, if you can't have all that stuff councils fund, uh, then it's very difficult uh, to have communities built. And that's what people are really trying to build 
uh, rather than homes is actually communities. So that's the starting point. We've got a massive shortage of housing and it's largely driven by infrastructure. And it really matters for a bunch of reasons. I talk to principals of schools. They say, you know what, one of our biggest challenges is, is that we've got a different set of kids every term because the kids don't have secure housing. They get shifted from auntie to uncle, some of them living in motels. I talk to the principal at Newmarket School and the Epsom lecturer. They say, look, we've got a whole lot of kids that have arrived, uh, been put by the Ministry of Social Development uh, in a motel down the road in Great South Road. Those kids don't actually have uh, much security or certainty in their life. And we're doing everything we can, but there's a chance that pretty soon they'll be gone starting again at some other school. Uh, it matters because there's a whole generation of millennials who are saying, look, we've done everything right. You know, we went to school, listened to the teacher, got a good job, saved up. Uh, and yet the, 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 the cost of a deposit has gone up 40 grand on the average house in the last year. That's 20% of a $200,000 increase. Even if we could save 40 grand after rent and tax, uh, we would be standing still. We'd be no closer to our savings goal. And then when people see that, they think, well, look, maybe this whole system is rigged against me. Um, maybe I should actually just change my mind, move on, um, and uh, maybe start a revolution or go to Australia. Who knows? So it's important for addressing equity issues. Uh, it's important for giving people hope that this country is a place where if you do the right thing, you have a future. Um, there's a whole lot of reasons that it matters to build more homes, but it's really difficult to do that uh, if you can't under, if you can't afford the pipes to connect it all together. So that's the, the starting point. Not enough homes because not enough infrastructure. Everyone in council and planning and development, uh, even the Minister of, of Housing from Labor, they, they all agree that that's the basic problem. Now, if that's the problem and you wanted to do something big to solve it, uh, probably something around planning and funding of infrastructure would be the right thing to do. And we'll get to that. <clears throat> what Labour and National have done is said, oh, maybe if we just got rid of zoning, maybe if we said every residential area in the top five cities and potentially other areas in other cities, if we, if we nominate them, uh, we're going to make them what we call medium density residential standards. And what that means is that you can build up to three houses on one section, up to three stories high. You can build them one meter away from the boundaries, eight meter wall straight up. And there's absolutely no objection, no question. Nobody can do anything about it. That's as of right. A lot of people would say, well, it's fantastic. You know, we're giving people freedom. They can build whatever they like, the right to build. Um, well, that's all, all good. Well, just remember, go back a step. Um, Maybe the problem is not a shortage of land you're allowed to build on, it's land that you can actually get connections to and having enough connections for intensification. So you go back another step and say, okay, um, if this, if this Labour national deal is going to solve the problem, uh, then why hasn't the problem been solved already by having the Auckland Unitary Plan that allows 420,000 to a million, that's their sort of estimate, that allows up to a million extra homes to be built in Auckland, and yet the prices keep on rising. Well, that's because actually, theoretically, they can be built, but if you can't afford to connect them up, can't afford to upgrade the infrastructure to do three houses where there used to be one, uh, then you're not going to go anywhere. And if you think about it, the logic that Labor have brought and National have joined in with is a little bit like trying to solve a fuel shortage by buying more cars. Yeah, we can't connect it together, but if we own more land, um, then we're going to be better off. So fundamentally, it won't work. Uh, but there's another problem with it, uh, and it's this. The way that Labor and National went about it, and they were saying today in the House, this is a deeply unconventional deal. They were saying, look, uh, we had to work together secretly, so we couldn't tell anybody else. They didn't tell the people at Auckland Council. Now, Auckland Council are pretty involved in trying to build infrastructure, connect it together, get people building more homes. And they've been doing fairly well if you look at the numbers being built, but not well enough. Uh, those people were, weren't even given a, a heads up or a, a pre-announcement briefing. It just came at them like that. If you look at the um, Wellington Mayor, Andy Foster, they'd just been preparing their new plan, uh, which now basically has to go in the bin. Uh, these people spend their lives, they don't get up every day and try to ruin you know, the housing market, they just have real constraints. They've all been told, get stuffed, anyone can build three stories on any section, three buildings, 
um, and you guys will just have to figure out how to service it. Unfortunately, uh, it's just not going to work because there won't be the infrastructure uh, for it to go ahead. The next thing that happens is that you actually end up with huge irritation and huge division in the community. People haven't been asked, haven't been consulted. And now people who are just saying, look, I'm not sure if I want an eight meter wall one meter away from my boundary. Uh, well, they get attacked. And there's, if, there's, if there's one problem in New Zealand politics right now, there's already enough division. There's already enough name calling. Uh, there's already enough legislation being rushed through by the Labour government, now national joining in. Uh, and people get called names like NIMBY and blah, blah, blah. And it's, it's really quite nasty and unnecessary. What we should be doing uh, instead of rushing this legislation through. Oh, that's one more thing. So they want to pass this law by the 3rd of December. What that means in practice is that they're going to make this law go through so rapidly that nobody who's all will be able to have any input into the select committee process. I mean, three weeks for people who are operating under COVID conditions who knew nothing about this to come along with an informed and intelligent commentary on it as if they don't have enough problems already when the alternative <clears throat> was to send it away to a select committee and do it like people normally do. So bad identification of the problem. It's not zoning, it's infrastructure for the most part. Um, poor consultation going in. Uh, a new medium density residential zone that is going to enormously irritate people. Division in the community, name calling resentment. It's just an absolute disaster. And as one person put it to me, look, <clears throat> Labor and National have no credibility uh, on housing. You know, they're like tired boxers at an end of a fight. They realize neither of them can credibly attack the other one into the election. So they've gone into a clinch like tired boxers. Very boring for everybody else, but it is much safer for them. The only reason they've done this is because they know no one will believe them after the last 20 years of rising prices and doing nothing constructive about it. All of which leads to the question, how would ACT operate uh, to get together and unite people behind good ideas to actually build new homes and address that very urgent concern that we have. Well, you probably guessed it, we'd start with the infrastructure. So what we'd say is, look, last year, $2 billion uh, worth of GST was collected by the central government in Wellington from people who were building homes, $2 billion. So the council has to do all the connections, all the work, um, and the central government, which really has nothing to do with home building, uh, they get to keep the two billion GST on building the homes. Well, what we say is that that is totally the wrong approach. Uh, and what should have been done is they should have gone along and said, look, we're going to split that GST 50-50. We're actually going to let half of the GST uh, go to the council that is having the housing built in their jurisdiction. That means that Auckland Council, for example, would get about 400 million based on last year's building activity. Uh, that's about 20% of their current capital budget. So it's a real boost. And here's the thing, if you want more housing getting built, the more houses they let get built, the more GST they get shared uh, from the central government's GST take on the housing getting built in their, in their area. So it's a policy that would actually help Labor and National achieve their goals. It would help a generation get more homes built. And it would mean that we don't end up with sewage in the streets because people built a whole lot of houses where the council had zoned saying, look, we'd actually prefer if you built it over there where we've got some infrastructure. Um, it means that we actually will have infrastructure that works. We're not going to have sewage on the streets, sewage on the beach. Um, and that's what one developer has said to me. This is the sewage in the streets bill. Um, so that's the first thing that, that we would do is actually have a mechanism that rewards councils for letting stuff get built and actually gives them the money to fund it. The second thing we'd do is that the government has this thing called the Infrastructure fi Finance and Funding Bill, IFAF. Now, IFAF it is a pretty good idea. They passed it a couple of years ago. What it says is if, a, if, if somebody wants to get a private investor uh, to build some infrastructure, to put in some pipes, to build a rec center, whatever, then actually they can get private investors in and pay them back uh, with a bond over time. Now, if we actually allow those kinds of public-private partnerships, that's another way that we could get around the fact that councils are massive, massively indebted and give other people something to invest in for their retirement or whatever. That would be a really smart thing to do. But you know what? We asked the government about this, and they said, oh, look, that's on the back burner. You know, we're not worried about building the infrastructure. We're just going to let everyone build the houses and think about the infrastructure later. This is totally nuts. Uh, so we've also said that they should allow that to happen. 
the final thing, and, and this is slightly technical, which is the, is the zones that they use. If you go to the modeling that was done by an accounting firm, I think it was PwC, uh, they modeled how many houses will be built with this new medium density residential zone being imposed on every residential area in every city in Northland. Uh, in, in Auckland. Um, what it says is when Auckland introduced the mixed, mixed housing urban zone and the mixed housing suburban zone, people built more houses in those higher intensity zones. So if it worked then, if we do even more, then maybe we're going to get um, even more housing built. Well, there's two things wrong with that. As we discussed, uh, it may be that the reason people haven't built more houses already is not the lack of zoning. They've got enough zoning. They don't have the infrastructure. That's why I say, uh, you know, trying to solve an infrastructure shortage by zoning more land is like trying to solve a petrol crisis uh, by buying more cars. It's just simply not going to work. But second of all, this new uh, medium density residential standard, that doesn't appear in the modeling. What the modeling tells them is if they had more mixed housing urban and mixed housing suburban uh, housing that's available, well, well then, then oh, zoning, uh, then more houses would get built. So here's a logical conclusion. Why not, if, if they want to do this, say, okay, we're going to take all the areas that are currently single family home, and instead of introducing a, a new and much more radical standard that allows an eight meter wall, one meter from your boundary, why not use the mixed housing urban zone which doesn't allow as much bulk, or even better, the mixed housing suburban zone, which the modeling shows allows more houses to get built. These are the options that are there. Why introduce a whole new type of zone when there are familiar zones we already have that are less intrusive, uh, that still allow a lot more homes to get built? Now, these three ideas, the GST sharing, the public-private partnerships to fund more infrastructure without indebting councils on their overstretched balance sheets, and using familiar conventional zones, um, those are three things I put in a letter uh, that I wrote on Sunday night to Megan Woods, the Minister of Housing, and Judith Collins, the leader of the National Party, the people who have conspired to, to put this whole deal together. And I've written it in a genuine and constructive way, say, look, I want your policy to work. I want more houses to get built. If we're going to do that, uh, then you know, why don't you take these ideas on board? Now, at this point, does anyone want to guess? Have uh, I heard back from them? Uh, of course I haven't. Uh, they haven't been prepared to engage, and that is the big lie. They want to constructively and collaboratively work with other people. Well, with each other, maybe, because it suits their political interest to try and give themselves some credibility on housing and get it off the table. They just don't want to work with or listen to anyone else, and that includes planners, it includes councillors, it includes developers, it includes people that actually do this stuff uh, day to day. Uh, so... That's where it's up to. I think that people are going to be hugely annoyed when they, when, as people, more and more people realise what's going on, um, and and the next group of people that are going to be annoyed, are all those younger people desperate for housing who want a solution, and they realise the solution they've been sold uh, is not practically going to do it because the Labour Party and the National Party identified the wrong problem. Um, we're now going to go to a few uh, questions. Um, we've got. Um, uh, Sergio says, taking into account increasing interest rates, rates, insurance, premiums for mortgages, maintenance, costs, etc., aren't we risking finding ourselves in the situation of oversupply of, quote, cheap, affordable modern housing, townhouses, once the borders are open? Um, look, Sergio, that, that's not a bad question. I, I actually don't think that we're in danger of having an oversupply of housing. Um, uh, one thing I agree with Labour and National about, and X's been saying this for a long time, is that we have a problem with housing, and it's fundamentally a supply problem. And it's ultimately a problem with infrastructure funding, which, you know, is what the Ministry of Housing, uh, Minister of Housing said when we asked her in December uh, before they cooked up this plan to just zone more land as if that's going to solve everything. Now, um, you know, so I, I do think that getting more homes built is the right thing to do. I just think focusing on zoning with this new, really radical eight metre wall, one metre from your boundary uh, zone is, is the wrong way to go about it. It won't work and it's going to cause far more irritation uh, than people were hoping for. Um, the next thing that uh, we get asked by Kate is, can I stop an, ob an obtrusive development with legal action under the new rules or has the government taken my right to object completely? Uh, well, Kate, it, it's pretty clear in the legislation. Um, this new medium density residential standard 
applies to all currently zoned residential land. So a single family home, in the Auckland case, it's either single family uh, or mixed housing suburban or mixed housing urban. All of it uh, will be upgraded uh, or downgraded, depending on your point of view, to this medium density residential standard. Now that standard basically says um, you can build up to three houses, up to three stories high or 11 meters plus one meter for the roof. Um, it's to be two and a half meters from the front boundary, uh, uh, one meter from the uh, other boundaries uh, at the back and the, and the sides. Um, there's no real requirements for uh, outlook space. So normally you've actually got to have some space outside your main windows, four meters by six meters under MHU. Under this, it's taken down to three meters by three meters. Um, there, there are really very few restrictions um, at all. And the, the government goes on to say in this legislation, or the Labour Party and the National Party's legislation says um, there can't be any building standards outside of what's in that legislation. So there's about two pages uh, of rules there. Uh, that's the sum total. Now, of course, some people will say, well, that's fantastically flexible and great. Um, two issues, of course, not so great if you can't actually connect the infrastructure. And secondly, uh, not so great if you're actually living by it and you're bought into a particular neighbourhood and then you've got that eight metre wall, uh, one metre from your boundary. So on the face of it, Kate, there's, there's very limited exceptions. Uh, another thing about it is that they can identify individual properties that are heritage properties, for example. Um, but, you know, they're going to have to go through with each property, justify its heritage status. They can't have heritage overlays for a neighbourhood, for example. Uh, so, you know, council is already under the pump. They're in a very limited time to go through the process of identifying uh, which properties are, are heritage. It's just putting massive pressure uh, on councils. Uh, for very little result, I would argue. Um, the, Aaron says, can we make these reforms and build infrastructure at the same time? Well, Aaron, that, that ultimately is what ACT is suggesting. Uh, let's incorporate the GST sharing and the public-private partnerships so there's actually a way um, to build infrastructure. But I would argue, in the Auckland context at least, where we already have 420,000 to a million possible dwellings you know zoned under the Auckland unitary plan uh, you probably don't really need to mess with the zoning much if at all uh, to get this done so you know yes we can do both yes I think we should do both uh, but I would just argue that if you had to pick one you do the infrastructure funding first because that's where the real challenges are um, we've got Paige who asks do we have enough builders and workers to do this at the moment especially during COVID um, Paige, I, I think that it's really true that there's a big shortage of labour. You talk to anyone in the building game, they'll say our biggest issue, um, apart from the fact material costs keep going up with all the inflation and supply chain issues around the world, is actually just getting enough builders and having the border closed is putting massive stress on all sorts of labour markets. Very hard to get enough people. That's leading to wage inflation. Not bad if you're getting paid more, um, but pretty bad if you're the one paying for the services. So look, there is a real challenge with builders. I think the way to solve that, apart from letting more people in and doing better at trades training, lots of issues around that that aren't really part of, of what they're doing right now, uh, is that we, we need to get better at using better building techniques, more factory construction, uh, more high productivity stuff so that you can build faster and more, more houses um, without having to have as much labour. That's how it works in most businesses most of the time. Why did the Japanese come to dominate the car making? It's not because they had more car makers, it's because they actually got robots to start making cars while everyone else was hammering hammering them together with people. Uh, and so X argument, another part of our housing policy that I haven't gone into, I won't, won't go into great detail, is we say, look, we should let uh, private insurers guarantee uh, a new build. Of course, they have to put down a bond, they have to carry the can if it that goes wrong. But I think what would happen is that you'd see a lot more flexibility and innovation, a lot more ways to build new homes. I, I think that could really go a long way. Um, so look, but the building supply of builders, that, that's definitely an issue too. Um, Simon says, I'm halfway through a development based on the old rules. This government has let me down as our build could have been much more profitable. Uh, this is on land held for 30 years for this reason. How can government change rules in such a reckless way? Um, well, Simon, I mean, you know, that's obviously a very difficult and frustrating position to be in. Uh, again, I would just say that if the government 
and by, I mean Labor and National in this case, who remember that they've, they've joined up on here, on this, uh, had been more open about what they were planning. They were planning this for three months without telling anybody. Uh, then actually maybe you would have found out earlier and you could have made better decisions. Um, but it's certainly true that you know you, you, you're going to have uh, r real disruption because people will say, well, geez, you know now this is all changing. Uh, maybe I'll hold off. And at least initially, it's actually going to reduce construction activity. But like I say, I think the real issue is always going to be um, the infrastructure. Uh, someone called CD uh, says, what do our mayors say about all of this? Is there anything we can do to stop it? Um, well, CD, I, I haven't heard Phil Goff. Uh, I think he has made some comments and he's pr pretty mild, but miffed would be my reading. Andy Foster, the mayor of Wellington, was on TV last Tuesday when they announced all this. Uh, and he seemed pretty angry about it because they'd just gone through all the work of trying to get their planning done so their infrastructure and their development all linked up and now that's not happening uh, so they're pretty upset um, so look uh, i think you'll hear more from the mayors the mayors of christchurch the mayors of tauranga the mayors of hamilton uh, but so far you've heard from the mayor of wellington and to some extent uh, the mayor of auckland you've also heard from chris darby who is the chair of the auckland council planning committee he's pretty annoyed they didn't consult him and he's also pretty upset when you look at it that um, you know he spends his whole life. He's not he's not someone that wakes up thinking how do we deny houses to the next generation. He get, wakes up and thinks how do we get our zoning and our infrastructure and our funding um, all and our consenting all lined up so as much housing gets built as rapidly as possible in a way that builds attractive communities. And basically, he's just sitting there saying, oh, you know, uh, these guys really need to be more respective. Um, and um, then um, we get, uh, with this new legislation, we'll still have enough environment or clear land around to continue our natural resources. They want our houses to be relatively close together. We're we losing natural environmental space. We're going to have to say, probably, if, if this legislation makes any difference, um, it means there's probably going to be more housing built closer to the centre of cities and less at the fringes. So if you're worried about land being taken up, it's probably by and large a good thing. Um, so it's not something to worry about there. Tom says, what about MUDs? I think he means municipal urban districts. We worked in Texas to address affordable housing. Should we try that here? Look, that's what this infrastructure finance and funding uh, legislation is about. It's special purpose vehicles to try and get private money in, uh, paid off by bonds to fund infrastructure without indebting councils. Uh, I do think it's an idea there. Um, I'm just going to address uh, in the last two minutes We've got a whole lot of people asking questions about these vaccination mandates. Um, I want to say what I think. I mean, I'm someone who you know has been fully vaccinated for a long time. I think vaccination works. It's very important that people get vaccinated because, frankly, it, you know, people are going to argue about all the evidence. I say go to the New England Journal of Medicine. It'll tell you that after six months, you're 96% less likely to get serious illness if you catch COVID. That means the ICUs aren't filled up. That means we can get back to life without seeing carnage in that particular part of our society. So that's my personal view. Uh, then you come to the question of mandates. Uh, as I've said many times, I, I think that a business should be able to choose what their rules are. If you want to have a nightclub and say, actually, I think you should be allowed to, uh, should have to be vaccinated to come to my business, my rules, well, look, that's just choice that adults make in a free society. Where I think the government has gone far too far is that they have now said whole categories of businesses are going to have to be uh, vaccinated or they can't operate at all. So at orange and red, there's a bunch of businesses, they just say, sorry, you're shut down, you can't operate unless you have a vaccine mandate. There are things that you cannot legally do in New Zealand uh, if you're not vaccinated. Now, look, I think you should be vaccinated, but I also think that when government starts mandating things like that, First of all, I don't like the precedent. Second of all, I don't like the division it's causing. Uh, and it's actually, ironically, from the government's point of view, starting to make a lot of people who are fully vaccinated more sympathetic uh, towards people who are not. When Dave Dobbin comes out and gets into politics, uh, you know that something's not quite right. So look, that's our view. I know a lot of people will be going mad about it. Um, X view, I think, is, is pretty rational. Uh, we do believe that vaccination is a good thing. We do believe that businesses should be able to make their own choices about what their rules are for people coming onto their premise and their staff. And often, most of the staff will want actually to be made mandatory. Um, that should be a business's choice. The government should make that clear. 
But when it comes to the Prime Minister getting up saying, if you want to do this, get vaccinated, um, I don't think that helps her brand of kindness. I don't think it helps New Zealand's social cohesion. I don't think it's a good, pre it's a good precedent uh, for New Zealand. Uh, and that's why we've said, I, I think she's gone too far on this now. And it would be better to say, look, we're going to have a Freedom Day. You don't have to get vaccinated. Businesses may choose that, that that's how they're going to operate on the 1st of December. We're taking the restrictions off and everyone is free to get back to their way of life. That would be the right way forward. Unfortunately, the government is now creating real chaos. So we've started this about housing. I know there's been lots of comments we wanted to address about that. Uh, and I think Act's view is the most rational and balanced view out there on how people with different views on vaccination can work together. Anyway, that's 7.30. We promised we'd keep this short and sharp. I really thank everybody for listening in. And please uh, check out our website, check out uh, what is in the news, check out my op-ed on the Herald website about this housing issue because it's going to get bigger and bigger as more and more people find out about it. Thank you very much for your time.